Okay, good. So, so we can get started. So, so yeah. So what we'll we'll talk about right now. So once we 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 set up on the general theory of Poisson boundary for groups acting on spaces, and we have this sublinear tracking criterion and so forth. So and then we can apply it to some more concrete situation. And I mean, the general situation is the situation of a group which acts on a hyperbolic space. So in fact, I call this a weakly hyperbolic group. So I'll give you a more precise definition that, that this is a, a, a lot of this, what I'm talking about today is, is in this paper that I have with Joseph Meyer. So it's a but it's a general setup, so we can we can start generally. So we talk. So what is the? So first of all, we we want to define a gram of hyperbolic space. So first of all, we say a geodesic metric space. So so geodesic means that every two points have a geodesic connecting them. It's so let's call it, it always will denote by XD is called delta hyperbolic. If there exists some delta such that for every triple of point X, Y, and Z, you have the following situation. You have X, Y, and Z, and you draw the geodesics forming this triangle. So you have the geodesic from X to Y, the geodesic from Y to Z, and then you have the geodesic from X to Z. And so the space is hyperbolic if the triangle looks like this, this we call the thin triangle. So it looks like a tripod in a way. So that <laughs> looks like this. So what, how do we make it precise? Well, we say that this, this delta, which is uniform for all points in the space, you want that the geodesic from X to Y or any geodesic from X to Z, because there could be more than one geodesic from X to Z, is contained in a delta neighborhood of yeah, the union. So of a geodesic from X to Y, union a delta neighborhood, of a geodesic from y to z. This is the classical picture, very, very important in geometric group theory, that you know if basically the geodesic from x to z first fellow travels the geodesic from x to y up to a certain point, and then okay, in the middle there's this delta fudge. You don't know what's happening, but only for sort of distance delta, and then it fellow travels the geodesic from y to z. So so strictly, strictly speaking, that the neighborhood of geodesic from X to Y is something like this, and the neighborhood of the geodesic from Y to Z, something like that. And so you want that this, this path here first is in one neighborhood, and then it's in the other one. So this is a completely metric definition, which of course, is verified for certain spaces, but not for others. So the most famous example would be if X is a tree. So it could be an infinite tree or finite tree. So if X is a tree, basically every, you know, every triangle is zero thin because, well, <laughs> For every three points, if you draw the geodesics, you'll get a form of tripod. You get you get this. So this for delta even equals zero. But in general, delta could be not. The, the main idea is instead of having this idealized situation, we have a slightly more concrete uh, coarse situation where we we are allowed to to make some error, but this delta is fixed once and for all. So this is a classical example, then another 
classical example would be x to be h2, the Poincare disk or the hyperbolic plane. So in that case, well, if you take three points, well, you see that basically you, you only need to check. So the geodesics are, you know, arcs of circumference, which are tang uh, which are orthogonal to the boundary. So the geodesics look somewhat like that. Very good. <laughs> and I mean, the point is that you only, it turns out that you only have to check, uh, you know, as, as the points go to infinity, because if the points are in a compact set around, say, the, some base point, well, you can pick some delta. Doesn't matter if the space is finite, there's always some delta that works. And as, as x and y, y and z goes to infinity, well, they converge to the ideal situation, which is, which is like that, where you have three geodesics that are orthogonal to the boundary. Okay. And well, the cool thing here is that since 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 G, which is PSL two R, acts transitively on triples. on triples of points, triples of points of the boundary. Well, you have to check only one triangle because they all they all such triangles have the same geometry. And so then you can measure what happens in this triangle. And then you you yeah you you can find a sort of instant in in circle of this triangle and the in circle of this triangle basically basically gives you the delta and so the question is what is delta <laughs> well, this is a computation that you can do in this in this model so if you if you have time <laughs> but there is there is such such delta so and on the other hand well the obvious counter examples are Euclidean spaces in higher dimension. So counter example, the classical one. Is where X is R2 with the Euclidean metric, because in that case, you can draw a large Euclidean triangle say say equilateral it doesn't matter too much you can scale here yeah anything you have you can scale so the delta that works for one triangle since you can scale if you get a, a triangle which is twice as big you need the twice as big delta actually <laughs> so that that's another way of thinking about it and so of course there is no uniform delta so other otherwise said if you know if this is length n, this is length n, and this is length n, well, you see that the in circle, yeah, what's the radius of the in circle? <laughs> if you really care, you can, right? You can figure out what is the trigonometry. So what's going on here is what n. So this is n over two. <laughs> this is what n. Part of three over four, something like this. Is that right? Oh, okay. It's good that you're worse than me at elementary geometry. So, <laughs> so this is n over two. <laughs> okay, right? Yeah. So, so what? So. Triangle is one, two, square root of three over two. So we divide, okay, over three, I guess.
right? Or square root of three, or maybe square root of three. No, one, two, square root of three. So this is n over two square root of three. Anyways, yeah. Anyways, so so whatever it is, it's it's a, it's a constant multiple of n. So when n goes to infinity, so 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 there is no delta. No delta, independent, independent on l. Okay, good. So what's going on? Okay, so. In general, so in general, so okay, so if, if G is a group, so G, uh, a finitely generated group, is where the hyperbolic if, well, if the Cayley graph of it is, is hyperbolic in this sense, which is sometimes called Gromov hyperbolic, because of course, so this theory was developed by Gromov. So if there exists some S finitely generating set, finite generating set, such that the K graph of G with respect to S is delta hyperbolic. And what is kind of interesting here is to note that any two generating sets give rise to a different metric. But if one is delta hyperbolic, so that all the others are delta hyperbolic. So if the Cayley graph of G with respect to S is delta hyperbolic, for some S, then the Cayley graph of G with respect to S prime is delta hyperbolic for any S prime finite generating set. And the reason for that is that the, the, the two metrics on, on G given by these two generating sets are quasi-isometrically equivalent to each other. So it's a little bit like this growth rate, whether the growth rate is exponential or not. Well, up to quasi-isometry, you cannot tell the difference. And the delta hyperbolicity is a finer state, is a finer property, but it's also quasi-isometrically invariant. In fact, maybe, yeah, in a second, maybe if you, if you state the Milner-Schwartz theorem, you will see one possible way of proving it. So, in fact, in general, we have the following. So we can recall that a group action of G on X is properly discontinuous if, well, for every X in, in X, there exists some U open set containing open containing X such that the number of G in G such that G U intersect U is finite. And And a group, yeah, a group action is co-compact if, well, if the quotient x mod g is compact. Otherwise, saying there is a compact set, there's a compact set k in x compact such that x is the union of all the translates of G. Okay. So in fact, so the, the, the important lemma here 
Der Milner Schwarz Lemma. Is that if if a group G acts properly discontinuously and co-compactly, if G acts properly discontinuously and co-compactly, on again a geodesic metric space. So this is important; otherwise, it's not true. X. Yeah, and and X is delta hyperbolic. Then G. So, so yeah, so G is delta hyperbolic. Yeah. So what I want to say is that. Yeah, it induces a match the induced metric on X and the induced metric and the metric on G are quasi isometric to each other, for instance, and and X is delta hyperbolic. Then G is delta. Then G is word hyperbolic. So the point is G G acts on some some space in a properly discontinuous and co compact fraction fraction then the metric on X and the metric on G are in the same quasi geometry class so one is delta hyperbolic if and only if the other one is delta hyperbolic so as a corollary well you can see that right if if G acts if G acts, uh, if some Cayley graph is delta hyperbolic, then G acts also on the other Cayley graph in a co-compact and properly discontinuous fashion. So G, yeah, if Cayley graph of G for S is delta hyperbolic, then Then G is word hyperbolic. This is by definition. <laughs> by that, but then G acts also on the other Cayley graph in a properly discontinuous and co-compact. So the other one is also hyperbolic. So Haley graph GS prime is also okay. So so what are examples of hyperbolic groups? Well. Clearly, we locked the trees. So the easiest example of word hyperbolic groups well, you have G the free group in any number of element, in any number of yeah, any rank, because again, the Cayley graph of the free group in R generators with respect to the standard generating set is a tree. And yeah, as we saw, is a tree of two, two and two R, yeah, two R, two R regular tree. So clearly if you pick another generator, so you get a different geometry, but it's still, Still that hyperbolic. The other case which we care a lot about is if G is group of isometry is a subgroup of the group of isometries of n-dimensional hyperbolic space. And so that again, this action is so that this action is properly discontinuous and co-compact.
And so then we take M is the quotient of HN by this action is, is a compact hyperbolic and manifold. So the classical case here is surface, a closed surface. So here, so as an example, we say the pi one of SG, where G is a closed surface of genus G. Sorry, with SG is closed surface of genus G. And so this one has an easy uh, sort of, well, at least for certain generating set, you can really draw the picture. So this is a classical picture. So the classical picture is you can think of a disk and you can draw a polygon in the disk, a regular polygon. So you draw a regular 2 m gone, or even 4 m gone, in the disk, right? Regular with respect to the hyperbolic metric, for instance, the class, the easiest one is you draw an octagon that it doesn't look very regular but <laughs> and okay so for instance an octagon and we make sure that the the, set, the sum of all the angles is 2 pi so that you see you in in hyperbolic plane you have a whole family of of regular polygons that you can draw given a given a number of sites because you see you can you can make it sort of smaller then it becomes more flat so to speak or you can make it much bigger and then it becomes more curved like that this is the limit this is the limiting behavior that you can do and you see in the limiting behavior the angle here is zero while in the in the other limiting behavior, the angle is like for the hyper, for the Euclidean polygons, right? So whatever the Euclidean polygons <laughs> angles are, well, in the middle, yeah. So we know that the for instance, right? For octagon, for instance, example, yeah. If we want a more concrete example, we can say for m equals two, so you take a regular octagon octagon well in in the euclidean plane every angle of the octagon is 135 degrees i think <laughs> so in the euclidean in the euclidean plane you yeah every angle is 135 degrees so it's three theta is three quarters of pi i think all right, I think so. Yeah. So, so, so the total angle, the total, total angle, is three, three quarters times eight times eight, so it's six pi. Right. While, so, so we can choose an intermediate. So you see that. So the in the the limit on case here. The total angle is so each angle is three, three quarter pi. So we want to choose the intermediate, choose theta. You want then so that the total angle is two pi. So so it can be done because in the extreme case you get zero, and in the other ca extreme case you get six pi. So at some point you will find some position where this angle theta is two pi over eight. So we start from here. In the middle, there is some some situation where eight. So so a regular angle for m gone where with internal angles eight. 
theta is 2 pi over 4m. So such situation exists. And in that case, we can construct this quotient. So in, in that case, you have a picture which is somewhat intermediate, somewhat like that. Like that. And then we can we can label the, the sides in the following way. So, so we label the sides alternating, like, okay, this is A1. Next one, we label it B1. The next, we label A1 inverse. The last and we label it B1 inverse. So each four of them, four triple of them, we label it like that. And then we see, yeah, we do this m times. So the next one is A2. This is A2 inverse. This is B2. This is B2 inverse. And so. So we label the sides. Label sides as A1, B1, A1 inverse, B1 inverse, and then we repeat this n times. So that, then we change the index A2, B2, A2 inverse, B2 inverse, and so forth, up to AM, BM, AM inverse bm inverse and so we we produce so see, recall that the group of isometries of of the disk say orientation preserving isometries of the disk is psl2r so we can find some matrices so that map yeah, this side to that side, basically. So we can find, so we we assume that the sides where, which, where there is no inverse have, have counterclockwise orientation. So this side has this orientation. This side has inverse, so it has the opposite orientation. So there is, there is a, a map, there is a matrix that maps this side to this one. So there is a matrix M A1. So for each for each label AI find a matrix in 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 PSL two R such that yeah M AI labels the side AI <laughs> to A inverse. <laughs> so these are the sides, <laughs> sides in, in that sense. So it identifies the sides with the correct orientation. So you need ones for the HAIs and also for BI. So you do BI, BI inverse, and so forth. And so what it turns out is since since the angles are 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 correct, the group generated by this matrix is, is discrete. So this is not completely trivial. This is the old theorem of Poincaré. So since the sum of the internal angles. is 2 pi by Poincaré's theorem. It's a bit more general, but particular. Well, it basically says that if you have to check these angles and the, the sums over different orbits have to be uh, rational multiples of pi. 
So in particular, if it's two pi, that's fine. But for Christian, the group which is generated by this, so the group gamma, which is generated by this matrix is M I M B I. is discrete in PSL2R. And in fact, so it, it, it so it acts, so, so it acts and so it acts properly discontinuously. And co compactly on H2 or on D. So the picture is like that. The picture is like that. So you, you have a circle. And then you have this octagon. And if you if you apply those those transformations, you produce other copies of the same octagon. So for for instance, from here, if you if you map it that that way, you you will produce an other octagon like that. And so forth. So it, it turns out. Yeah, it turns out that if you do the identification, for instance, okay, we can try, we can test this this bit, which you might have seen before, in the topology course, right? So, so if you identify those, so this is a one, a one inverse, b one, b one inverse. So first of all, we can test that every every vertex is in the same class if you do this identification. So if you think about, so if you take this guy, for instance, where is this identified to? Well, this is the, the head of A1. So the head of A1 is also here. But this is also the head of B1, right? So the head of B1 is also here. But then this is also the tail of A1. So the tail of A1 is also here. And now you can do the other one, A2, A2 inverse, B2, B2 inverse. And so you see that this is also the tail of B2, of B2. So it's the same as this one, which is also the head of A2. So it's the same as this one which is also the head of B2, so it's the same as this one, which is also the tail of A2, so it's the same as this one. So in the end, by, by these identifications, there's only one class of vertices, which makes sense because by the Euler characteristic formula, you, you would have to have that, otherwise you don't, you don't have a correct surface, right? So let's, let's double check that. So, but in general, right, so, so here, in fact, if we pick for M, so in this case, so notes that every, yes, all vertices of the polygon are in the same gamma orbit. And in fact, we can we can consider the characteristic function. So, so what is the quotient, right? So we have we have d mod gamma. Well, this is compact clearly because, well, this it has a compact fundamental domain. So, you see, you can pick k to be this original polygon, which is compact. So, so the the, the quotient is a quotient of this polygon. So it's compact. 
And well, in fact, you can you can compute the characteristic Euler characteristic of this, right? What is the Euler characteristic? Right, so this one you can you can think of this as a cell complex, right? So what, how do you compute the Euler characteristics? Right, you you take the number of, of one cells or zero cells sorry, minus the number of one cells plus the number of two cells. And so what? What are the number of zero cells here in the quotient? One, because all the all the vertices are identified. So the number is one. And how many are the one cells? So, well, the one cells are the sides. So we have four M sides, but we identify them in pairs. Right? So we have 2m. And then we have a number of two cells. Well, how many two cells do we have? Two cells of this. So yeah, we have a disk, which is this one, right? This is one. So the so just to check, the Euler characteristic is two minus two m. And so the quotient is a surface. And what's the genus? Well. You know that the Euler characteristic of the surface of genus two is two minus two G. <laughs> so G, the genus G equals M. So in particular, if we start, if we start with an octagon, and we do this identification, well, the qu the quotient is famous surface of genus two. Then if you start with the 12 gun, you get surface of genus three and so on. And from the hyper, so that's just from a purely combinatorial point of view, but from the point of view of, of uh, hyperbolic geometry, well, again, you, you, you have tessellations and here you see at each, at each thing, at each edge, you have, yeah, you have a tessellation, it's hard to, to draw, and uh, yeah, there's there's eight of them actually here. The total angle here, so it turns out that since all the vertices are in the same class, at each vertex here, if you go around, you see these octagons, and you see precisely eight of them, and that's why we we had to pick two pi over eight. Each angle is two pi over eight. So when we pick, we have eight of them. So we get angle two pi. So that's why, so that's why we have a nice smooth manifold. So each angle is two pi over eight. And so you have eight of them. So since we picked internal angles, theta equals two pi over for M, this is true in general, then at each vertex, in the quotient, we have a total angle of Yeah, that's right. Of four m times two pi over four m, so two pi. And so, in part, in, in principle, this this quotient might not be a nice manifold at this point because you don't. This depends a little bit on on how on this quotient, because each point inside is not a problem because we already have a neighbor here, and that each point in here, well, we have that this is paired with some other side, so we have. Eight, you know, half, half. So we have pi on this side and pi on that side. So that's also fine. The trickiest points are the vertices, but that's why we pick them like this. So, so the quotient, the quotient, 
which is SG, which is D over gamma is a smooth manifold. Smooth surface. Okay, so this is a very nice geometry. It's a, well, of course, very classical, but it's it's a non-trivial example of a group which has a co-compact, properly discontinuous action on a hyperbolic space. And the group in question is the group generated by this, which is the same as the pi one of the quotient surface. And so in fact, this group, we know a presentation for this group. So for each G genus at least two, well, we know that gamma G is the group indeed generated by this AIs and BIs such that one is less than I less than M. And also we have one, this is not a free group, we have one identification which is given precisely by by running around the boundary of the polygon and reading the labels. And all, if you, if you, basically, if you do the loop, if you concatenate all these paths, you get a loop. And this loop is homotopically trivial, so it can be contracted to point. So it's, it, it's the, you know, it's the identity element in the, in the group. And so, so the only, in fact, the only, non-trivial relation we have is, is exactly that, this, this one. So usually it's written like this, that the commutator, the product of the commutators is one, is the identity, right? So where we recall the notation for commutator is A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So this is a nice, surface group so again so again gamma g is the pi one of the surface of genus g which is also can be thought of the disk quotiented by gamma g through this representation of gamma g in psl2r that i defined before Right. So here, clearly, on this side, we have just the topological picture. You can start with just the surface as a topological object, and you have the pi one, so the space of loops of the homotopy. On the other hand, this surface also has a metric structure. It's it's an actual quotient of the disk, which has a nice hyperbolic metric by some discrete group of isometries. And and so this this surface. So so again, S G equals D mod gamma G has has a metric as a hyperbolic metric of constant negative curvature as a metric of constant curvature minus one precisely because we start with the disk that has this nice metric and the group psl 2 r is the group of isometry so it preserves the metric so the metric descends to the quotient. So this this is not just yeah, this is not just a uh, manifold, but it's smooth manifold, and not just a smooth manifold, but metric Riemannian manifold, and not just Riemannian manifold, but hyperbolic manifold with a constant negative curve. So again, all this yeah, somehow this is not the topic of this course, but this is a very very important example to keep in mind. Okay, so this is um, this is one example of, of a non-trivial non example, non-free hyperbolic group. So in general, in general, in higher dimensions for any, for any, n bigger than two, 
Well, you can consider again a group, gamma, a group of isometries of HN, again, acting properly discontinuously. And for compactly, well, if you just do that, the question need not be manifold, but it's it's an orbifold. So then, yeah, then gamma is word hyperbolic. And gamma is isomorphic to the pi one of the quotient. And okay, if we just assume the properly discontinuous and co compactly, well, the question need not be a manifold, it could be an orbital. But okay. so this is a hyperbolic. Okay. So, yeah, also let, let me finish by, by saying the following. So, however, note that not, not all groups, fundamental groups of hyperbolic manifolds are, are word hyperbolic. So, there are, so if, so yeah, so there are, you can consider, if you can consider, one considers, a discrete but not so compact subgroup gamma in the isometry group then then gamma may not be word hyperbolic So in fact, so in dimension two is kind of a slightly exceptional case. <laughs> but in higher dimension, it's, it's, it's more tricky. So, so in fact, in dimension two, well, it's still hyper hyperbolic for some somewhat simple reason. <laughs> so, so you can consider consider maybe someone's favorite group of hyperbolic of, of, of matrices, two by two matrices. If you take gamma to be PSL two Z, as a subgroup of PSL two R, well, this is discrete, but not co-compact. And in fact, the fundamental domain is not compact. What's the fundamental domain of PSL to Z? This you might have seen in other courses. So if I look at the upper half plane, Right, yeah, exactly. So PSL two Z is generated by these two maps. Z goes to Z plus one, and Z goes to minus one over Z. And so a way to 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 find fundamental domain is is the following: you write the unit circle. You draw the lines at one half, like that. And so you consider the following region. This is one half, this is minus one half. And yeah, it turns out, so we, if we call T, T of Z equals Z plus one, and S of Z equals minus one over Z. Well, this region is a fundamental domain. 
And what it turns out is that this side gets mapped to this side by T. T just translates by one. But then S, S is a different type of element, S as a fixed point. So S of I is I. So this element, this point I is fixed. And what happens is that, you know, this side is mapped to the other side. So this side is mapped to the other side like that. It's flipped like that. Okay. And 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 so so you 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 induce a, a, a surface, quotient surface, but this quotient surface is three strange points. So there is omega, let's call this omega, the third root of unity. And okay, this is the uh, yeah, this is a, what is it? omega square. Six roots of let's say six six roots of unity. This is omega square, but th those are identified. So it turns out that the way the way you think about this is the following. So first of all, in a hyperbolic metric, well, in a hyperbolic metric, recall that the hyperbolic metric is is the Euclidean metric divided by y. So if you if you go up, the distance between these two sides gets really, really close to zero. So this is not, the, the picture is more like this. So it's more like these two, surf, these two sides go like that. And then you have this geodesic in the middle, like that. And this point is problematic, well, in the sense that you're, you're, you're taking your, if you think of it as made of piece of paper, it's like you're taking this piece of paper and you're flat and you're and you're yeah you're folding it like that. So the total angle here is is pi, it's not two pi. So this is slightly problematic. And and on this point, well, what is the total angle at that point? Well, this point is identified with this point. So the total angle here is 60 degrees, and there's other 60 degrees on the other side. So the total angle at this point is 120 degrees. So this total angle is pi over three. And the total angle here is pi, right? The pi over three, yeah, right? Yeah. No, pi over, sorry, 160 is what? Is two pi over three, yeah. That's <laughs> 120 is 2 pi over 3. Yes. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Because pi is, is, you can think of pi as 2 pi over 2. Yeah. And so, so how do you construct the quotient? Well, one way to say is you can cut here and, and fold there. Right? You have this, this half, and you have the, this other half, which is sort of the back side, and you fold them. So in the end, you get a surface that looks like this. Because you see, yeah, if you if you, you think of this as having a front side and a back side, right? So so this point is 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 a is a point where the total angle is not it's not two pi, but it's just pi, right? So this this has angle two pi over two, and this point has angle two pi over three. So these are called orbital points. That's why, because the total angle and this nice metric structure, yeah, it's not two pi. So on the other hand, this point up there. Well, you see, the surface is not compact <laughs> because so so this point, yeah, the the you see this 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 short a curve that you start with the curve here gets shorter and shorter as you go to there. So this is called a cusp point. Okay. 
So in this case, so if you consider sigma, which is H2 mod PSL2Z, which is called the modular surface, this one is not is is not compact but it has finite area finite volume so the way the fact that it has finite area has to do with the fact that this goes up to this grows like one over y so yeah, you have to do the integral. It's not that complicated, but you, you have to do the integral. And so, so this is an example of, of a non-compact finite volume hy hyperbolic, well, orbifold, because it's not quite the surface, because it has these two problematic points. However, you can also find there is also, there is a group gamma. Yeah, let's call it gamma. Gamma two inside PSL two Z with finite index, finite index subgroup such that, in fact, sigma two, which is H two mod gamma two, is a man is 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 a surface is a Riemannian. surface. So basically the idea is, is you, you can consider a slightly larger hyperbolic, yeah, slightly larger fundamental domain instead of, yeah, instead of that domain, you can consider the following domain, minus one, plus one, like that. Can consider this domain. And in fact, in this case, I think you just say, I think you just consider gamma 2 generated by the following z goes to z plus 2, and z goes to minus 1 over z. And in that case, the fundamental domain is that. And uh, let's see, it turns out that the, the no, not, not this one, sorry. This one. So, yeah, I forgot to what is the correct generator. So definitely T that goes so so there is one that, that maps this side to this side. So this map is is clearly yeah. This map is clearly Z goes to Z plus two. And then there is another one. Okay, we, we have to think about I forgot. I forgot to what is the formula is, but you can find an element that maps this guy. To, to this guy. We have to think slightly about it to see which one is it. But the point is then the quotient, the quotient is a triply puncture sphere. So quotient looks like that. Yeah, it could be just a reflection at around zero. But uh, no, but that's not in PSL two R. It has to be orientation preserving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Maybe you have to put this. This yeah. Maybe it's like yeah. You, you have to put this one on the other side. So, yeah. Well, okay. We can come up with with the formula. But yeah. So, anyways, there is. So this group is not very far from this one. There is just a finite index subgroup. So this is a finite index subgroup of this one. And then when you quotient, you get again a non-compact 
And in this case, hyperbolic surface. Riemann surface, which has three cusps with three cusps. Because, yeah, there is a point at zero, point at one, point at infinity. They're all in different classes with respect to this group action. So what is kind of strange here is, however, in dimension two, yes, you can construct a non-compact surface, but then what is kind of strange is, well, strange. It's a coincidence that this group still is hyperbolic in the sense of GOMO, because this group is, is free. <laughs> so then it turns out that gamma two is isomorphic to the group, the free group in two generators. <laughs> so, so it is still <laughs> well hyperbolic, even though even though it does not act co-compactly. On, on H2. And this is because in, in, in dimension two, there are not really too, too many things that can go wrong. So now what happens in dimension three? Well, in dimension three, things can go wrong much in a much worse setting. So for N equals three, on the other hand, if gamma acts in, on H3, even orientation preserving, like discreetly, discreetly, so let's say properly discontinuously, and the quotient has finite volume. Well, it is not. It is not the case. It is not the, necessarily the case. Usually, most mostly not, mostly not the case that gamma is word hyperbolic. And the reason is, well, it's harder to come up with a concrete concrete. A uh, group of matrices. I mean, you can, but like, so the reason is the reason is that if, yeah, if you pick G in the isometry group, yeah, let's say that if consider. Parabolic subgroup. So consider P the stabilizer of of a point psi in in gamma for psi in the boundary of H three. Then P yeah P contain P may contain. Copy of Z2. So the idea is the following. So if we pick, so this is a picture of, so this is H3, the upper half space, and this is the boundary of H3. We put it like in the plane. Well, you can pick a point Xi in the boundary. And well, it turns out that, yeah, there, you can you can most of the time if what you have is that the set of of elements that that fixes the psi fixes a parabola like that. And basically, the situation is that this this horrible is. Is homeomorphic to to R two. It's a two dimensional surface, and so there are group elements that, yeah, you can move in two directions. So 
So basically, you can you can yeah yeah I guess even the even easier case is if you point if you fix the point at infinity if you you put you you put yeah maybe the easier case is if you put the point x at infinity so we put it up there well you can move in two di dif different directions and still preserving the point at infinity right so so the fundamental domain is some sort of chimney like that. So basically, 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 you can you can easily construct a group where where you put two different translations, and and those would fix the point at infinity, and then you can put some other stuff in there, and the cost. Yeah, we'll have rank two. Yeah. So the point is, example, yeah. Yeah, in this, in this, in this model, right? If you say H three is. X, X, Y, Z, such that Z is bigger than zero. We can pick two, we can pick G of X, Y, Z equals, I don't know, X plus one, Y, Z. So this is G1, G2, X, Y, Z is X, Y plus one, Z, then, the group generated by G1 and G2, of course, is Z2. And there, there is a way you can you can you can add some more elements, few few more elements in the group of isometries. Such that is the gamma generated by G1, G2, Gm acts properly discontinuously. On H3. And the quotient has finite column. That's finite volume. So this is an example of a group that acts properly discontinuously on a hyperbolic space. And in fact, even the volume is finite, the volume of the quotient, but the, the quotient is not compact. The, the quotient looks like hyperbolic three manifold. So there could be some, some topology here. And here, this looks like a chimney like that. Like, it has it has a square base and yeah it looks like a square times a half line so it's a cusp so this is, looks like zero one squared and zero infinite okay good are there any questions this is all the geometric part which is somehow <laughs> Sort of just to remind you what are some some geometric applications of what we're doing. So we can take a break before we we start with the run and walk part. So we can start at eleven twenty-five. No. That's right. Okay, so I guess we can restart. So I think we are have seen enough geometry for today. So let's, let's start with now mention like, yeah, let, let's start with actual 
um, yeah, we're, we're going more, more to, to the random walk part. Okay, so, so first of all, okay, one other thing we, we have to say is we have to talk about isometries of hyperbolic spaces. And so, again, if, if XD is a hyperbolic space, hyperbolic metric space, well, first of all, the, you know, we need to give a few more definitions. So first of all, you say that a metric space is proper if closed balls are compact, so if for every, any, X is the space any R, the space of X in X, that's the, the distance between, sorry, Y in X, the distance between X and Y is less or equal to R, it's compact. So we looked at so far proper spaces, like example will be finite dimensional manifolds. But then there's also interesting non-proper spaces. So non-proper example well for instance you would have a tree with 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 countable valence. So tree with countable valence meaning that at every point, at every node of the tree, there are countably many edges coming out of it. That's a perfectly good delta hyperbolic space is delta hyperbolic. But non-proper. So that's the problem. Well, that's one of the issues that, in fact, in, in several cases where the group does not act on a proper hyperbolic space, but sometimes it acts on a non-proper hyperbolic space. So that's uh, that's one thing. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. So now the other thing is for isometries. So so okay. So given given G in the group of isometries of this XD, we, we consider the translation length. Which we denote as tau of G. And this is the limit as N goes infinity of the distance between O and G and O divided by N. Again, the limit exists by subadditivity. O is some for some O in X. And once you look at that, then we look at the classification. So So yeah, so the classification of isometries of delta hyperbolic spaces. Did like classification of elements in PSL 2R. So this is generalization. So the first one is tau G is elliptic. Well, if it has a fixed point, okay, as a fixed point in X. So the classical example we know already is, you know, G of Z equals minus one over Z in on 
if x is h2. So we know that the fixed, so this would be a rotation at, at, at i. So this is, so in general, the classical case would be you fix a point and you're rotating around this. So but this could be a slightly different. There could be more things happening here because there's more space. So you can fix a point and you can permute things near, near x, but that's still fine. OK. So the other one is g has does not have yeah so let I guess there's two ways to see, see about it does not have a fixed point in x and tau of g is zero so this case is the murkiest one. So you can sort of sweep a few things under the rug here because in the in the classical case, the parabolic case, so g of z equals z plus one, for instance, if x. So in this case, this point has a fixed point on the boundary, right? G, g fixes point on the boundary of x. And well, you can check the tau is zero because, because if you go around, if you translate, yeah, the, the, the hyperbolic distance is, is, is getting, is sublinear in fact, right? I mean, this is a classical picture that if you pick a point here and you translate it like that by n times, Then, in fact, the distance, the hyperbolic distance, because the hyperbolic geodesic is like that. So the hyperbolic distance is actually log n. So that's why the translation length is zero. Even, even if you're moving n times, but the, it, there's actually the shortcut. So, so in fact, tau is a, so tau. However, in a non-proper space, there are various things that could happen. So it's, it's it's not really it's not completely true that we have a very very good classification of this case. But in any case, the other cases we have that if tau of g is positive, in this case we call it g is called the loxodromic. And if so, G fixes two points. On the boundary of X. So in that case, it's, it's, yeah, it's actually much, yeah, this also behaves nicely in this case, because basically what happens is that there's a one, there's two points that are fixed psi, psi plus and psi minus. And yeah, so basically it's, yeah. In the classical case, G would have to fix a geodesic between them. Well, it, this is not quite true in general, but still, still will G coarsely does the same. G will translate along this plus geodesic and then it will, on the boundary, the action will be that G is repelling from this point and it's attracting from this point. So one repelling and one attracting. So yeah, the classical case here would be, they said G of Z equals two Z on on H. So this should go zero will repel, zero would be repelling and infinity would be attracting. Okay, so so why would we, we care about this? Well, we, we have to give a definition which is the non of non-elementary subgroup.
So definition is a summing group, even summing, classification of summing groups is also even a bit trickier, but a semi group gamma of the group of the group of isometries is called non-elementary in this situation. If it contains two loxodromic elements. With disjoints fixed sets. So basically, in a picture, you would have four points on the boundary, and you would have an element G that fixes these two points and is loxodromic, and an element H which fixes these two points and the, 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 the small points are distinct, okay? So we need at least that to be true for our semi-group for, for the random walk to have good properties. And so we define, so a measure as a, yeah, a probability measure on G, which is a subgroup of a isometry group of X of XD is non-elementary well is the semi-group generated by the support of new is non-elementary as you could guess. Okay, so now we can state the main theorem. So Mar and myself the following so okay well to to be well in fact this assumption is not really needed but yeah so 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 we say that x is separable p is separable if it contains a dense countable set So, okay, so let's G be a group of isometries accountable group of isometries. of a separable delta hyperbolic metric space okay so okay we we start so we take our base point and let mu be Mu a non-elementary measure on G. Then what? Then first of all, there is the convergence property. So what is that convergence property? For Almost every 
run a walk wn sample path the limit of the walk exists so okay yeah i guess i haven't told you precisely yet to what is the boundary so a gram of hyperbolic space has a natural notion of boundary so which i will tell you next and 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 in fact this in this metric context almost every sample path also converges to the boundary so exactly like we did for the uh just uh, hyperbolic uh, h2 so the other one is well you also have something like positive drift so if there, if there's no finite first moment, you cannot say that the drift is finite. So there exists L positive such that the limit over N of D O W N O over N is at least L for almost every omega. Oh So at least so, so the random walk does escape. Well, the existence of the drift, the, the limit, is more or less equivalent to the finite first moment. So if if you have a finite first moment, so if mu has finite first moment, then well, then indeed. The limit exists. Almost sure. Okay. So So this is the second statement, which is again generalization in many ways of first number results for for matrix groups, because in this metric context, indeed you have just you do have the convergence to the boundary, you also have the positive drift. So yeah, and so what about the Poisson boundary? So for the Poisson boundary. Of course, what you would get, what you would like to have is that, okay, we have new, which is the hidden measure of, again, of this W of this random walk on this, this gram of boundary. And it turns out that this gram of boundary is a metrizable space. And it's compact if the space is proper, but otherwise it's not non-compact. But still, you can think of that as a GMU space. So you can still think of whether this is the Poisson boundary. Okay. And so to do that, well, we need some condition because um, yeah. So we need so we need a properness condition. We need a properness. Condition to to state to conclude that this one is is the Poisson boundary. And in fact, there is two properness conditions. So in the paper with Joseph, we 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 had the the weaker version of it, and actually more recently we have a stronger version. So. Maybe I can just tell you the stronger version. Why not? Right. So, 
So the, 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 the weakest version is the WPD condition. So WPD stands for weakly properly discontinuous. So we talked about So we talked about uh, proper discontinuous actions. So, yeah, but, but in general, the, to ask that a group has a proper discontinuous action, that's, it's not, a, yeah, it's, that's too strong, but also it's too strong if you're acting on this non-proper spaces. Like if you're acting on this group, the space with, you know, this, this tree with infinite valence, then, then this is too much ask. But WPD, which is, I think is due to Basvina Fujiwara, is the correct, or at least one, <laughs> one correct way to, uh, to analyze this, this notion. So in general, we can define the joint stop for stabilizer. So the stop, stop K, Yeah, the stub K of, of, of X is the core stabilizer is a set of G in G such that the distance between O and G O is less than K. This is called a coarse stabilizer. And what is a WPD element? So define an element, yeah, it has to be a loxodromic element, a loxodromic G in the group of isometries of XD is WPD. If the following is true, so you look at this group of elements that course this levelizes elements on the axis of G. So the element is like that. So 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 remember that it okay if G is loxodromic then take a point you look at G N of O. So so, so G moves along, the, say, quasi geodesic like that. And the question is, yeah, can it fix both an, yeah, can it fix both O and G and O at the same time? How many are there elements that that can coarsely fix this and coarsely fix that? So recall that if the action is properly discontinuous then the coarse stabilizer is 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 is, is fine. So, so now recall that the properly discontinuous implies that the stabilizer of k x is finite for every x and k. Right. So here. Because, so, so here we don't want that. That's too strong. But we want to say, okay. So suppose there is an element that that moves O not too much, and it also moves G O not too much, or G N O. Is it possible? Uh, and WPD tells you that well, this is only possible for finitely many cases. So if there exists some O. And some n such that the course stabilizer and okay the course stabilizer of O and the course stabilizer of H of G and O is finite and okay there is an on K, there is an assumption on K, any K, yeah, exactly. Okay, so for if the correct statement is for any, for any O in X and any K, 
constant, which is this 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 balls, okay, is the size of that ball. Yeah, there exists some n such that such that this is fine. So again, it is possible to rotate around O somehow. This is allowed, but if you take two points which are far enough on this on this axis, so this is the axis of G, this is G, plus geodesic, it's not possible to both fix this point and this point. So that would correspond to sort of rotate around this, this geodesic. And this is possible, but for only finitely many choices of H. Okay, so this is a, Fairly weak condition, and uh, yeah, but it's it, we need some condition because otherwise the, the the action of G on X could be really bad. It could have like discrete, uh, sorry, it could have dense orbit, and then we really don't know what to say. Yes. No, 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 no. This condition is interesting in non-proper spaces. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This condition is, is useful in, in non proper spaces. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, we, yeah. no, no, that's right. So, there is a notion of a, yeah, there is WPD, and there's another notion which is called acylindrical. Yeah. So, acylindrical is stronger than WPD. So in fact, uh, historically, <laughs> we first proved it for a cylindrical in the original paper with Joseph. And then more recently, we, we up, upgrade to WPD. But for certain actions, we don't know a cylindrical. So we know WPD. So examples, okay, let me just briefly say. So if G, yeah, if G is the mapping class group, then we can take X to be the curve complex. Curve graph. Then, then, yeah, then the action of G on X is acylindrical by Bowditch. What, what, what is that? Yeah, I can tell you what that is. Yeah. So acylindrical means that for any x and y, the core stabilizer of x intersect the core stabilizer of y. It's fine. Okay, maybe it's epsilon stronger than that, but this is the base basic idea that you can take any two points. And now and now you want to say, okay, if I stabilize both one point and the other point then this can only happen with finitely many choices. Yeah, let's say that the distance between X and Y has to be large enough. So, so this is stronger because we have to check every pair of points. Well, this one we don't. We just say, okay, we pick O and we pick another point which is on the axis of G. So it's 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 one it's only in in this axis direction that you have this property. Oh, so this is of one specific... Yeah, this is of one specific element. That's right. Right. So yeah, so this is asymmetrical, and in fact, every pseudonaz of element is is WPD. But yeah, on the other hand, if if G is out of hand, for instance. And X is, uh, for instance, I, I guess, prefactor complex. Whatever complex, I think. So I don't think we know, we don't know that the action is asymmetrical. Maybe likely it's not. So not like, so not likely to be so asymmetrical. Cylindrical, but But there are, but there are WPD elements. Uh, 
So in fact, the, the most recent paper has the following very general statement. So let me say it. So, so the theorem, the most general version with, with Barang and Kunal and Joshua, so it's Chala, Fresh, for honey. Fresh and myself. Now this is just last year. Is it like this? So suppose, okay, suppose again, G is a group of isometries of of delta hyperbolic space. Uh, let, yeah, suppose that G is generated by the support of mu, just, yeah, this might be movable, but anyways, let's just use that. And G is not elementary. G, the action of G of X is non elementary. And also, it contains a WPG element. And contains a WPD element. Yeah, and moreover, and suppose that the entropy H of mu is finite. So we don't have any logarithmic moment here, even though this was in the classical setting, we, we had to, but in this new setting, we, we no longer have that. So as long as the entropy is finite, then this boundary of X with the hidden measure is a model, is the possible boundary. So you see that we do need certain level of properness, but somehow just the the, the minimum, uh, <laughs> the minimum one. So of course the applications of this are really general. So because again, so okay, the easiest one would be G word hyperbolic when X is a Kelly graph. Yeah, this action is 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 proper, co-compact. So okay, this is this was even though removing the yeah, just having the finite entropy condition was not known before. So even for just the word hyperbolic group acting on itself, we used to need some moment condition. Now there's no moment condition. But then yeah, also the what are the other examples? So again, well, again, if G if G acts on say HN, for instance, or, so is a, so G is a fundamental group of a manifold. So this acts properly discontinuously, for instance. There is no need to be co-compact. Then again, we can take X equals HN. So we say that the gram of boundary of HN, which is just a geometric boundary, is the model for the Poisson boundary. So this covers all the hyperbolic manifolds. There's interesting other examples. So G is the free group of countably many generators acting on itself. So X acting on, yeah, it's Kerigloff. This is a finite, infinitely generated group. So the, so the Cayley graph is an infinite graph. It's an infinite tr tree. But uh, yeah, the action turns out to be WPD. Uh, this is a nice, nice exercise actually. Yeah, and then, okay, th this, the other groups that you care about maybe in geometry or, okay, so if G is relatively hyperbolic, let me just say this, the things. And X is the cone of space. So 
another example. So in this case, you it's it's similar to to, to this group acting with the cusp on H n, but it's it's more general. But then you you can act on a non-proper. So this space is already non-proper. So you need a non-proper theory to do that. And then again, this 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 groups that I was just mentioning before. So let me just write them. So you have G, the mapping class group acting on the curve complex. G is out of N acting on the factor complex. G is a right angle arching group acting on the extension graph, for instance. So in this case, the action is asymmetrical, I think. In this case, the action is asymmetrical. In this case, the action is not asymmetrical, but WPD. And then what else? Well, and yeah, if you care, the other group, it could be the Cremona group. That's the group of birational transformations of P2. So it's a group coming from algebraic geometry. And this, this acts on the so-called Picard bounding space. This is very, in a way, exotic from the point of view of Geometric group theory, but still interesting example for algebraic geometers. It turns out that this, this space also is hyperbolic. In, in fact, it's it's very similar to infinite dimensional hyperbolic space of constant negative coverage. So it's similar to H infinity in many ways. So this is kind of just a, by chance it happens. <laughs> it also works in this case. <laughs> yes. Um, like an action like WPD. Mm -hmm. You say that in, like the whole uh, group action WPD it persists WPD elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I meant in a loose terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. I mean, the question in general, the question in which elements are WPD, is a hard question. Um, so usually, what what is what what one can prove usually in the settings is that if there is one WPD element and you do this random walk, then random WPD elements are generic with respect to the random walk. So the probability of elements being WPD goes to one. But on the other hand, for a precise element, sometimes depending on the action, yeah, for instance, already, yeah, yeah, actions for out of hand, for instance, I think in that case, it's it's really not not completely determined which which elements are WPD, which elements are not. I mean, this is still uh, still an active area of research. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know. So at this point, I think probably not so. Not make much sense to to start with any proof of anything because we're pretty late <laughs> so that's good so anyways so I'll, I'll start with uh, some ideas of the proof on on thursday so in, in a way you don't you will not need the geometry to be honest because it will just be about metric spaces okay good see you guys